Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, this is a fun talk to me, for me because uh, Bessie was actually an inspiration to my own flight training. I'm a pilot. Got my pilot license about 27 years ago uh, and had a bit of a difficulty doing it for financial reasons, uh, which, uh, which are experiences I've shared with many people, including Bessie Coleman. Uh, but what's interesting is that I also uh, I worked for Sierra Academy of Aeronautics for a while, and, uh, and I was trained in accident investigation by the NTSB. And so a lot of these uh, experiences that I've had, I'm an, I'm an aerobatics pilot myself, and uh, to be able to bring all these things together and, and read the story of Bessie is something that's, uh, that's pretty uh, moving for me. So um, uh, hopefully you'll find the same inspiration that I did uh, and uh, let's have at it. <laughs> now, interesting thing, 19, 1922, um, actually in the winter of 1923, if you happen to be uh, a wealthy person in Orlando, Florida, and you are needing a manicure, you might find yourself at the table of this, uh, of this charming, bright, very talkative 28-year-old woman uh, named Elizabeth, who is uh, doing your nails. And the, the remarkable thing you may have noticed is how fast she was. Whether or not you noticed the little uh, yellowing framed headline next to her um, that pro uh, from a, uh, a newspaper in Chicago that uh, proclaimed her as the world's fastest manicurist. <laughs> but what you may not have known is that even up until a year before that, uh, in 1922, um, what you may not have known is that she was actually a much more remarkable achievement. She had a much more remarkable achievement, and that is she was one of America's most famous aviation pioneers already. Because what happened is that by 1922, um, by 1922, what was happening is that Bessie Coleman was a, already an internationally famous uh, aviator and pilot uh, because she was actually the, the, the first African-American aviatrix. And the, <laughs> and the first woman pilot in the world to hold an international pilot's license that enabled her to fly anywhere in the world. And, uh, and so for the past 18 months before, uh, before you're having her nails done, she was actually thrilling thousands of people on both sides of the Atlantic with all of her stunts and, uh, and her hair-raising achievements. But uh, let's take a step back to show you how she got here. Now, she was born in 1892 in Atlanta, Texas, uh, and she was the 10th of 13 children, and she was, uh, she was born into a, a very large uh, family of sharecroppers. And uh, when she was three, she and her family moved to Waxahachie, Texas, uh, where they were picking cotton and uh, doing laundry and that sort of thing. And then in, uh, uh, when she was seven years old, her father had to leave the family, go to Oklahoma in search of uh, better work, and uh, he never returned. So she, from the time of seven, until 23, stayed in Waxahachie with her family, supporting them by uh, as a laundress and picking cotton. Uh, and she went to university for a year, but ran out of money and had to had to drop out. Uh, and so she was just uh, uh, trying to get a better life for herself. And so seeking that better life, she and two of her brothers uh, actually moved to Chicago, and they tried to create a new life. Uh, a new life for themselves. Uh, she got a job as a manicurist at uh, this place called the uh, called the White Sox Barbershop on the Chicago South Side, where actually a lot of uh, very elite people would come and have their nails done. And while working there, she meets a man by the name of Robert Abbott, who uh, she becomes friends with him. He's a millionaire founder and editor of the Chicago Defender, which was the uh, which was the world's largest. Uh, and most uh, and most read uh, newspaper um, uh, of uh, for uh, of uh, of the African American press, and so uh, her friendship with Abbott exposed her also, as well as being a manicurist, to a lot of Chicago's uh, uh, a lot of the black community leaders and and the uh, and the socialites of the time. And what was funny is that uh, Abbott really kind of had a crush on uh, on uh, Bessie. Uh, being a much older man and much wealthier, I guess, and he just was constantly trying to impress her by including her in his newspaper. And so for really bizarre things, in fact, one of the things that he would do is that he actually did a story on her proclaiming her as the world's fastest manicurist. And so that was, uh, that was a very nice thing to do. Um, I've certainly had worst first dates. So, uh, 
So anyway, in the meantime, in the meantime, Bessie was becoming enamored with uh, all these newsreels of people flying, and she wanted to be a pilot. So her brother comes back from World War or World War One, from the Great War, and is talking about oh how great French women are, and oh you want to learn to fly, ha! Huh? All these French women are flying. Uh, uh, you know you could never do that. And so she goes, I'm going to be a pilot, and so she tried, but of course. Because of her race and because of her gender, no one would teach her how to fly. Boo. Yeah. So anyway, so Rosie, so so Bessie got uh, Bessie got uh, really determined to do this and to taking flying lessons, and so she made up this little idea to talk to uh, to uh, to uh, Abbott and say, hey, you know, let's do this little PR thing where you like pay to have me become a pilot, and uh, so. <laughs> That was pretty good, and so she she kind of so she took the property advantage of that, and he said, "Well, if you demonstrate, you're you're serious about it." So she took two jobs, uh, both as a manicurist and also uh, making chili, and also um, she went on an off time and learned French because she said, "I'm going to go to fucking France and learn how to fly." So she does, and then she hops on a ship, ship, because she said, "I will not take no for an answer." Uh, pardon my French. I'm going to France. So she goes to France and she learns how to fly and she goes to this, uh, the most prestigious aviation academy in France, in the Somme. Right there over there, right there over there, right. Very good. So, yeah. So the interesting thing about that is that because Bessie, Bessie didn't know how to drive and Bessie didn't ride a bicycle, so she had to walk nine miles each way in order to take these flying lessons. She, she did that uphill both ways in the snow of France through the bomb craters. And uh, she received her license on, uh, she received her license on, uh, on June 15th of 1921. And not just any pilot's license, but the very first international pilot's license so she could fly anywhere in the world. And she's the first woman in history to do so. Uh, inspiring another woman in America, by the way, by the name of uh, Amelia Earhart. There you go. Very good. So anyway, so with the, with the, with the publicity of the, of, the, uh, of the Chicago Defender, she became, became very famous at this and had a triumphant return to the USA. But she realized that in order to make money doing anything other than giving people rides, she would have to learn how to do stunts and be a barnstormer and be a daredevil. And uh, she didn't have the skills to do this, and nobody would teach her here. And so she had to go back to France. And she didn't just go back to France. So because her whole point was that she wanted to Her, her whole goal was to be able to train other African Americans how to fly and um, wanted, to do, wanted to do that. And so this is what she did. She thought the best way to do that was to get trained in barnstorming. So she went to, uh, she went to Europe and uh, got, got aviation training. And uh, she, she met, uh, she met uh, uh, Mr. Fokker, who, created, who was the uh, creator of the Fokker triplane and the Red Baron and all that sort of stuff like this. And she went, flew all these really fantastic high-performance airplanes and uh, came back and uh, uh, had, a, had a really good time. Now, what was interesting about that, uh, here, and, and they welcomed her back. And uh, here she is flying over. The, she went over the Kaiser's Palace, and people were taking movies of her. And uh, it, was a, it was a whole lot of fun. Um, she became very, very famous, known as the world's greatest woman flyer. I don't know why they had to, put, to qualify that, because she, she completely was before Charles Lindbergh and all these other people. So anyway, so six months later, she went back to the Europe, and then she, it, and, uh, then she came back. And uh, so now, uh, she was really famous. So what happened was, uh, Oh, there we go. So this is another great saying that she said, the air is the only place free from prejudice. And um, clearly she didn't fly certain airlines. <laughs> so to remain nameless. There we go. All right. So anyway, so she was so famous that this guy named Peter Jones wanted to make a movie about her called Shadow and Sunshine. The trouble was is that she shows up to set and... They, they want to have, uh, so they're going to make this big, long movie about her. She shows up the set, and the first thing, okay, we want you to walk with, with a cane and a, and a knapsack, and we want you to talk with an accent, and we want you to be uh, uneducated. And she said, I'm not doing that Uncle Tom shit. Uh, and she walks off the set. And these all these people, so because she stood for, so, and so they were so desperate, they found this, uh, this Harlem uh, dancer, I think is the proper term, um, 
And, uh, and they, tra- they said, okay, well, you look kind of like her, so we will train. No one else, there was no other African-American woman who knew how to fly. And so they trained her at Curtis Field, where Beachy was. Uh, mentioned earlier, and they were able to do that because they threw enough money. So apparently enough money uh, was what w- was all that it took to get a, the second black aviatrix in the air. And uh, that's Miss Belsie Allison. They made the movie. Uh, we'll talk about that later. The movie doesn't exist anymore because it was one of the 70% of movies that were completely destroyed um, by time and nitrite. Um, so that unfortunately, there's nothing to show there. So anyway, well, in the midst of that, um, so poor Bessie couldn't get booked. She couldn't get elected dog catcher, and so she couldn't make any money. So she had to go back to Oakland. I mean, not Oakland, but Orlando, Florida, <laughs> and uh, which is where this story started. And uh, and she was doing the nails as a manicurist, making time. But then this company in Oakland remembers like, whatever happened to Bessie Coleman? I really like Bessie Coleman. So they hired her. They say, why don't you come out to be our spokesperson? And she was the first African-American uh, endorser for a major product, uh, Bessie Coleman, for the tires in, in, Oak, in East Oakland. And uh, she, she, with that money that she took, she, um, which is why, uh, she's opened a flight school at Oakland Airport, which is why if you drive into Oakland Airport, you can see her sign today, welcoming you in. Thank you very much. So... Um, she was on her, She bought an airplane for four hundred dollars, and on her way to a big air show that she can perform at, the the plane uh, the pl- the plane's engine quit. She crashed. She was she was uh, nearly killed. She was in the hospital for three months, uh, and and she still was going to say that you know tell them as soon as I can walk, I'm going to fly, and she did, and uh, she. Uh, uh, but the trouble was is that she crashed again, and so they grounded her, and so because she couldn't fly, she took up parachuting, and so she would jump out of airplanes uh, and off of wings while another person flew. So uh, the trouble was that she had, this, uh, her, she had a show in Jacksonville, Florida in, 19, in, uh, in 1926 where uh, she was going to be, uh, no one would rent her an airplane, again, because of her, a, because of her race and, and, her, uh, and her gender. And so she had to buy a plane in Texas, and a mechanic that she barely knew uh, by the name of William uh, D. Wills um, went out and got it and flew it in 21, in 21 hours. The engine quit twice as he was flying out there. He got no sleep. That day they came up. Uh, to do a practice run, and she was like looking over the top of the, she unbuckled her seatbelt to look out for the, for the drop zone to see where she was going, and the engine quit again, the plane stalled, and it, uh, and it sometimes happens at a stall, it, tur- it rolls over as a spin, she falls out to her death from a thousand feet. So the pilot, Mr. William uh, Wills, continued to fly the plane as much as he could, he crashed into a tree where he was trapped uh, in the wreckage, uh, uh, Bessie Coleman's publicity agent came over, uh, and rather than helping him out, looked on, lit a cigarette, threw the match, and it set the aviation fuel on fire and burned him to death in the wreckage. Yeah. So uh, that was a terrible thing. And, and the worst thing about this is that in the, in the papers, he is the only one uh, who has his picture in the paper, and Bessie didn't. So uh, that's even worse. So 16,000 people paid their respects to Bessie Coleman, and many other things have happened to that uh, since then. She's on that. She's on one of the dollars. She's on w- one of our stamps. And uh, just a little bit of a, 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 an addendum because of that. Remember uh, when she uh, uh, walked off the set and they had to hire a Harlem dancer to, to play her? Uh, well, this Harlem dancer did pretty well for herself. Uh, and in 1954, she was elected as the first African-American representative of the state of New York. So, so, you know, the butterfly effect has some good things. So, with that, I really want to offer a well-deserved and long-delayed toast to Bessie Coleman, Queen Bess. Thank you.